Okay, well, the, uh, the room is full, although uh, I'm sure that means that we'll have more people coming. So um, why don't we get started? I'm Daniel Benjamin. I'm the director of the Johnson Dickey Center. I'm delighted to welcome you here to this discussion of the U.S.-Israeli relationship and how that will look in the future. Uh, we have uh, a terrific panel, and I think this is exactly the right time to have this conversation. Um, let me just uh, note that on uh, October 1st, uh, historians may, um, may record as some kind of important point in this relationship. And um, uh, it wasn't that different from some other days, but um, it was nonetheless, um, shall we say, a pungent moment in, in the relationship. Uh, during that morning, um, President Barack Obama met with uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who is visiting from Israel. Their meeting lasted um, uh, a, a scant half hour, and uh, they bid each other farewell. There was no lunch for the visiting prime minister. Uh, instead, the president decided he would rather have lunch with the vice president. Um, later, um, uh, later that day, the State Department spokesperson, Jen Psaki, uh, issued extremely sharp criticism of Israel, uh, talking about new, um, uh, new developments in the Palestinian territories, and uh, said that um, uh, this development will only draw condemnation from the international community, distance Israel from even its closest allies, poison the atmosphere not only with the Palestinians, but also with the very Arab governments with which Prime Minister Netanyahu said he wanted to build relations. In addition, she said it would call into question Israel's ultimate commitment to a peaceful negotiated settlement. After this meeting, uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, appeared on uh, national news networks and, and declared that to criticize the settlements was un-American. So um, that was just one day, um, although actually the, the, the un-American remark may have been a day or two later. I'm, maybe there's some poetic license here, but uh, you get the picture. Uh, it's been a very bumpy patch. Now, it's not the first bumpy patch in U.S.-Israeli relations, as I'm sure our panelists will remind you, but it is a sign of a particularly rough moment in what has been one of uh, the United States' closest diplomatic relations, and certainly Israel's absolutely closest relationship, certainly since uh, the 19, early 1960s. And it raises the question whether after uh, the failure of uh, Secretary Kerry's peace initiative and uh, continual frustrations on the part of the administration to get Israel to stop uh, establishing new settlements, um, whether, uh, whether there isn't something uh, changing for good here. We've had many ups and downs before, but the United States has always, uh, at the end of the day, stood by Israel's side, and it's been an extremely close relationship, extraordinarily close, uh, 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 without a doubt. And um, so I thought it was a good time to discuss these issues, and I can't think of a better panel uh, to, to do it. Um, three of the foremost uh, experts on the, on the subject at hand, and I'm delighted that they're all here today in Hanover. Um, let me start off. Um, there, our, first, uh, our first speaker will be Stephen Simon. He's a visiting lecturer in Dartmouth's government department and a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute. He previously served as senior director for the Middle East and North African Affairs on the National Security Council staff at the White House. Uh, in 2011-2012, he served um, uh, about five plus years on the Clinton National Security Council staff, uh, and uh, he has also been a scholar at, uh, at um, the Council on Foreign Relations, the International Institute for Strategic Studies. He's taught at Princeton uh, and Georgetown. He writes widely, including most recently in the New York Review of Books, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, the New York Times. Um, he has even written in co-written a number of reasonably well-received books, including *The Age of Sacred Terror* and *The Next Attack*. Those two he wrote with me. Uh, *The uh, The Ark: A Formal Structure for a Palestinian State*, and uh, *The Sixth Crisis: Iran, Israel, America, and Rumors of War*. He holds degrees from. Columbia, Harvard, and Princeton. Our second speaker will be Ambassador Alfred Moses, who is co-founder, senior partner, and chief strategy officer of Promontory, a financial services firm that he recently co-founded. 
He has had a really distinguished legal career as a partner in the Washington law firm of Covington and Burling. He was special advisor and special counsel to President Jimmy Carter. And under President Clinton, he served as American ambassador to Romania and special presidential envoy for the Cyprus conflict, uh, an, a conflict roughly as intractable as the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, he has been uh, president of the American Jewish Committee, and he is a member of Dartmouth class of 1951, as I know a number of people here know, too, uh, who have come out to see him. Um, he was, in that, in that graduating class, the sole person uh, to graduate with a major in international relations with highest distinction. He also holds degrees from Princeton and Georgetown Law. He has written in the New York Times, the Herald Tribune, International Herald Tribune, Washington Post, Haaretz, and many other places. And finally, we have David Makovsky, um, no stranger to Dartmouth, having been here just a couple of years ago. He is the Ziegler Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and Director of the Project on the Middle East Peace Process. David's remarkable because he gets to both direct the project on the process, and when he's not directing it, he's trying to make peace uh, uh, himself. He just uh, concluded a 10-month tour on the Secretary of State's uh, peace initiative. Uh, he also teaches at uh, Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced and International Studies. He is the author of numerous monographs, essays, and articles, uh, and co-author with Dennis Ross of the 2009 uh, Washington Post bestseller, Myths, Illusions, and Peace, Finding a New Direction for America in the Middle East. Uh, his commentary has appeared in the New York Times, the New Yorker, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Wall Street Journal, and many other places. And um, I particularly admire David because he was uh, a journalist before he became a policy uh, person, and he uh, served as executive editor for the Jerusalem Post and was diplomatic correspondent uh, for Haaretz before uh, coming to uh, the Washington Institute. He has degrees from Columbia and from Harvard, so it's a great panel, and um, I don't want to talk anymore, so Steve, why don't you lead off? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Grab the mic. Over to you. you <laughs> and they all know each other well. Can you use the mic? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, well, I'm the, I'm the one who's supposed to throw the grenade in the swimming pool um, uh, here. So uh, let me get uh, started. I, and my thesis, uh, I guess, is that um, uh, the very strained relations between the U.S. Uh, and Israel uh, now, or in the Obama administration, uh, might be in some sense qualitatively different uh, to the perturbations in the relationship uh, in decades past. And we're going to hear a lot about these perturbations. And precisely because the relationship has had so many ups and downs, it's really very difficult to determine whether you're at a tipping point. I mean, determining whether you're at a tipping point is, I think, by definition, um, a, you know, something akin to the occult arts. But, um, uh, you know, when the, when the relationship has been so turbulent, it's especially um, and difficult to, to say that anything really is different. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is, is uh, talk in categories, really. I mean, the first one is uh, the category of strategy in the, in the U.S.-Israeli strategic relationship and changes in that domain that I think are underway um, that perhaps weren't quite so present uh, in the past or present in a, in a different way, um, a less con perhaps consequential way. Um, uh, then uh, I'm going to want to look at uh, a sort of demographics, culture, and politics. Um, and I'm going to do all this in, in 10 or 12 minutes. Don't panic um, or anything. It's just I'm going to skim the, uh, the surface and uh, look at changes taking place in Israel and in the United States that seem um, uh, destined, perhaps, recognizing that demographics famously is not destiny. Um, uh, inclined or likely to um, uh, cause uh, our two countries, the U.S. and Israel, to, um, to diverge in ways that will make the relationship, let me put it this way, make the relationship less special and intimate um, uh, than, uh, than it has been. So first on the strategic side, um, 
I was in a meeting with uh, uh, a very distinguished Israeli delegation. Um, it was kind of a track two meeting. And um, for those of you who are aware of what track two means in diplomatic terms, it, it suggests meetings between um, uh, representatives of two countries who are not official representatives of those countries. It's a place to sort of try and work out some issues uh, that are too sensitive or too undeveloped at, at that particular stage to talk about um, uh, government to government. And uh, in, this, in this meeting, um, The American delegation, it, I, I, I thought somewhat imprudently, was really pushing um, uh, the importance of the uh, Palestine question and Israel's relationship with the Palestinians, its readiness to make peace and so forth, making the point that this was an American interest. So um, if Israel was an ally, why wasn't it uh, acting in ways that favored the interests of its, of its ally? And uh, the response um, from uh, an Israeli delegation that was very middle of the road, I think, politically, uh, and had a great deal of experience in the context of the U.S.-Israel relationship, uh, got very uh, heated. Um, uh, there was anger, actually, uh, in, uh, in the exchange. And they basically said, look, uh, the U.S. is our one strategic partner, our one ally in that sense. And Israel has one strategic adversary, and that is Iran. And the US, the one strategic ally, is walking away from Israel's one strategic foe. Uh, and uh, this was put forward with such deep conviction um, uh, by individuals who um, uh, are not particularly connected to you know, any of the Israeli right-wing parties, let alone uh, the current uh, government in Israel, that I was, I was really struck. And then shortly after that, um, uh, I wound up back in government and uh, dealing with the Israelis who were, of course, serving um, uh, their country. And what I sensed, uh, and in fact heard uh, in quite emphatically, uh, on the part of a number of interlocutors was that uh, Israel had, in a sense, um, uh, outgrown or was outgrowing its relationship with the United States, its strategic relationship. Uh, Israel um, uh, had uh, uh, amassed uh, a very substantial military capability and a, and a strategic uh, capability. Um, uh, It was the preeminent military power in the region. And it had other options. This was the striking part of the discourse. That Israel had other options. And, and the, the argument related uh, in, a, in, a very, in, in a very organic, even umbilical way, uh, to the argument I had heard previously at this track, too. In other words, if, if Israel wasn't going to uh, get the benefits of an alliance relationship uh, with the United States, uh, it had better start looking elsewhere. And uh, this is where the discussion led to alternatives. There was China and, and India, with which Israel has a burgeoning trade relationship, particularly in the defense and security sphere, but in other um, uh, areas as well. And, and these were partners who perhaps wouldn't stand up for Israel in a crisis, as Israel had long expected uh, the U.S. To, done, to do, and the U.S. had, in fact, done. But on the other hand, they wouldn't try and interfere in what Israelis see as their domestic arrangements. Uh, and uh, that was a kind of important point um, to, these, uh, uh, to these Israelis I was talking to. And you know, against the background of the um, uh, arguments that broke out and the, f and the real, um, I, I have to say, intensity of the arguments that broke out during the first term of the Obama administration, I began to wonder whether the strains in that first term owed merely to, you know, proximate disagreements that would blow over and personality differences between two very, very different men, um, or perhaps it was something deeper. That's on the strategic side. On the, on the demographics, you know, in the United States, there are serious uh, changes taking place. Um, 
uh, Jews uh, are, in, in demographic terms, um, a, a shrinking part of the American polity. Uh, this owes largely to the phenomenon of intermarriage, which has now been studied uh, quite carefully and related to something that sociologists call the, the separation hypothesis, which is essentially the academic discussion of the nature and rate at which American Jews um, are becoming indifferent to Israel um, and, uh, and, and the fate of, of Israel, except in the most attenuated ways. And uh, the intermarriage has had uh, predictable effects uh, over the course of, of many years. And uh, the key thing is that the children, the offspring of intermarriages, tend almost exclusively to marry uh, members of the opposite religion. They don't, they don't marry uh, into the Jewish religion. So that's having uh, a serious effect on one part of US political support for the relationship. But on the evangelical side, uh, there's also a serious decline in both the size and the organization of the evangelical community, which combined with a generational change in that community has led to a change in priorities away from things like uh, Israel, which it viewed in a kind of eschatological scenario, um, uh, of death and destruction, but which entailed strong support, political support. Um, uh, so uh, they're going away too. So the, so the domestic sources of support for the relationship are going uh, away. Now, another interesting w related um, thing, how am I doing? Do I have a couple of minutes? You have a okay. couple of minutes. Yeah, OK. Um, uh, a related. A phenomenon is the politicization of the U.S.-Israel relationship within the American domestic context. Uh, this is a fairly new thing. Um, uh, Al Moses might have a different uh, view on that. In my experience, it was fairly, fairly new, particularly the way in which the uh, Republicans in their campaign against um, the Democratic incumbent uh, in 2012 used Israel uh, as a battering ram, as a political battering ram, saying that uh, the Obama administration had thrown Israel under the bus, and you know, fairly strong language of that kind. Well, um, as a leader of the American, current leader of the American Jewish community told me um, uh, in a kind of an interesting, and, and in a sense, um, tormented conversation, um, he said, well, you know, this is really, really a terrible thing because the Republicans instrumentalized the relationship for political purposes, and then Obama won by what counts in American terms nowadays as a landslide, getting pretty much the same proportion of the American Jewish vote that he'd got before. And the tormented part of this conversation was along the lines of, well, you know, uh, they've torn off the emperor's new clothes. Now every American president will know there is no price to be paid um, for alienating um, uh, 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 Israel um, in, in terms of, of policy debates. Now, uh, lastly, I just want to wrap up with changes that are taking place um, uh, politically uh, on in the United States, just to continue that side of things, and then and then very briefly on the Israeli uh, side, um, uh, Democrats uh, uh, look like they will be the dominant uh, party in the coming years, and Democrats have a uh, are statistically less likely to favor uh, Israel than uh, Republicans. So uh, you're looking at the establishment of. Uh, uh, perhaps not a permanent majority, democratic majority, but a, but a durable one, which looks at, um, at Israel somewhat less favorably, and which will be composed of a significant Latino component. And uh, the Latinos poll uh, as being less favorable towards Israel than, um, uh, than other Christians. On the Israeli side, uh, you're looking at a demographic trend that favors, that is within the green line, favors um, very orthodox Jews and Arabs. 
And the upshot is that you're going to wind up uh, with an Israel that looks very different to America than the Israel they're accustomed to seeing. And I think this will have an undermining effect on the sympathy uh, that exists between uh, our two countries. And what's so fascinating, and I'm going to end on this note, is um, the migration of non-European Jews in Israel to um, ultra-religious um, uh, uh, communities. I saw, um, uh, because there are serious financial benefits to doing so, um, and, and it just uh, the thing I wanted to close on, <laughs> that I wish I could show it actually. Um, uh, I have a video of uh, a gathering of Hasidim, it's in Israel, and uh, two of these um, uh, Orthodox uh, Jewish guys with the side locks and you know and and all the the uh, attributes of ultra Orthodox uh, usage are singing a famous song, a song made famous by Um Kultum, one of the great Arabic uh, uh, chanteuses. Um, uh, and it's a song of love and loss. And these two Hasidim were singing it, of course, in fluent Arabic, and in the most in the most moving way. I mean, it was really a moving performance, and uh, it was an illustration of the migration of Sephardim to European Jewish um, uh, Hasidic communities in Israel. The Satmar, the Belzer Hasidim, um, uh, they're attracting. Uh, Sephardim. And, and that, that video was emblematic of a, of a powerful change in Israeli society that I think will affect American perceptions in years to come of that country. Wow. Well, as the Center for International Understanding, I think we're going to have to post that on our website. So, uh, Al, over to you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Steve. I, I agree with everything you said except your conclusions. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, at my age, I'm delighted to be host anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you get the trifecta. Uh, Dan introduced me as a business person, lawyer, public servant, all true, and American Jewish leader. Uh, as American Jewish leader, I'm one of about five million. <laughs> <laughs> The Prime Minister of Israel once quipped that the United States must be a very small country. You only have one president. In Israel, we have three, four million prime ministers. All that is true. Uh, Steve, let me just respond to one point you made. It was perfectly valid. Uh, in the 2012 presidential election, Barack Obama received 70% of the Jewish vote. Mitt Romney received 30%. That is about par for the course. That was despite the fact that the Israeli government made it very clear that they preferred Mitt Romney. Indeed, the present Israeli ambassador of the United States, Ron Dermer, uh, stated publicly in Jerusalem, everyone understanding he was speaking for the prime minister, that the government of Israel would like to see Mr. Romney to be the next president. And what does that tell you? It tells you something that I've known for a very long time. American Jews do not vote in presidential elections on the basis of what's best for Israel. American Jews, like all other Americans, vote on the basis of what's best for them. And therefore, what affects American Jews is what affects all persons when they go into the voting booth. Economics, stability, order, worldview, and personal view. Israel doesn't show up, except for those who are disposed to vote Republican regardless. That's been true in this country since the creation of the State of Israel. And American politicians, by and large, don't understand that. But it's a fact. And those of you who think otherwise, we'll chat a little bit later. Uh, my view is that it is unlikely there'll be any sea change in the bilateral relationship. 
I say that with a high degree of certainty, but not absolute, of course. As a friend of mine said about a depression, you never know whether you've been in depression until you come out of it. And that's true here as well. I'm talking about economic depression. We won't know till later. But the signs that I see are not indicative of a change. Now, there will be a change in terms of how people think on the National Security Council staff under the last two years of the Obama administration. There will be changes in the thinking in the State Department. There will also be changes in the thinking and conjecture at think tanks and in academia. But that is not what makes foreign policy. I won't call it model airplanes. It's much more serious than that. But in a democracy, what makes the components that make for foreign policy are much more complex, much more sophisticated. A friend of mine whom you know, speaking of Brzezinski, when he was President Carter's national security advisor, was asked by Kuwaiti journalists, would American foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East be different if it wasn't for the American Jewish influence? And Spig, who was born in Poland, is Catholic, um, did not think very well of the Begin government in Israel, doesn't think very highly of Netanyahu's government today in, in Israel, replied, I can't answer that question. Because what you're asking me is, would American foreign policy be different if the United States were not a democracy? And that's the real answer. In a democracy, all the societal forces come to play on the formulation of foreign policy. For those of you who are studying government, and I don't know whether you have a course on this at Dartmouth, but if you don't, you should. Think a bit about who makes foreign policy in the United States. You might start by reading Ambassador George Kennan's diary. George Kennan, who was the Soviet expert, got credit for the containment policy, fairly or not, or rightly or not, was an elitist. He's right from Plato and Socrates. The elitist usually self-proclaimed, should determine policy. But that's not the way policy is made in a democracy, whether it be in Israel or in the United States. So let's look at what we have. Uh, historically, the United States relationship with Israel has had its ups and downs, as Steve said. It started with President Truman's recognition of the state of Israel. And it's interesting, a little footnote to history, when he was given the statement to sign recognizing what was called the provisional government of the Jewish state. He crossed it out and said the state of Israel. This is the President of the United States correcting a memorandum that came to him, became the United States' recognition of the state of Israel. At that time, the military and the State Department were very much opposed. Secretary of State George Marshall said he would have to think hard as to whether he could support President Truman in the 1948 election if he recognized Israel. And the relationship between the White House and the Defense Department, James Forrestal, the first Secretary of Defense, was equally frosty. And that continued well into the 60s, didn't change, to really after the Six-Day War and President Johnson authorized the sale of phantoms. And then the military supply increased almost without stop. There was some slowdown, some cooling off. But the, the F-15s came, the F-16s. But still, when I was in the White House in 1980, the administration called off a simulated submarine exercise with the Israelis. These are not submarines in the water. These are people pushing buttons. But President Sadat of Egypt objected. And the administration felt sufficient pressure to cancel a joint simulated submarine exercise with Israel. This was after the signing of the Egyptian-Israeli Peace Treaty in March 1979. Under President Reagan, the relationship became more friendly, greater support rhetorically and otherwise. It went on slow burn under President Bush I, then heated up under President Clinton, under President Bush II, and under President Obama. Although the rhetoric has changed, the military relationship has not changed. And something that Steve said, uh, or he, was, he was referring to things that 
some Israelis had said that they might turn to India and China. Let me be very clear on this. The United States is the only country in the world that Israel can look to for support. We are the ultimate guarantor of Israel's security. And anyone in Israel thinks that China or India can fill that role is woefully mistaken. It just cannot happen. This produces an asymmetrical relationship with Israel knowing in its heart of hearts, including Benjamin Netanyahu, that the United States is the ultimate guarantor of Israel's security. At the same time, the relationship is asymmetrical. My friends in the State Department used to talk about the tail wagging the dog. There's some truth in that. Israel's a very small country. The United States is a, a large country, militarily unequal in the world. The fact is, that relationship is one that Israel must preserve. And it's taking, in my view, unnecessary risks in going through these sort of spats with this administration or any administration. But this is not new. We had difficult relationships between the two countries and President Eisenhower ordered Israeli troops to leave the Sinai in 1957, February, David. He's much older than I, he remembers all of these things. <laughs> he's my son by a previous <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I might say it, it was an intermarriage. <laughs> we had difficult times in, in the early 80s when Caspar Weinberger talked about the possibility of hostilities breaking out between Israeli forces and the US Marines in Lebanon. We've had ups and downs throughout the relationship. But the fact is, and this is my second thesis, the fundamental interests of the two countries are such there's not likely to be a rupture. Like it or not, just as the United States is Israel's only ultimate guarantor of its security, Israel is the only reliable ally the United States has in the Middle East. It's the only functioning democracy. It's the only country where the people think more like us than they think like others. And the fact is, it's unlikely in my view that the United States is gonna to tilt towards the position of the Arab world, writ large or small. Writ large, it's the entire Arab world. Writ small, it's the Palestinian Authority and Hamas. We can deal with those separately. In terms of writ large, you've got extremism of a kind that makes us shudder. Both Sunni extremists and Shia extremists whether it be Iran, whether it be ISIL, when you see Americans being beheaded, I don't think we'll ever see anything like that on the part of any Israelis. Our two communities, more or less, in the largest sense of it, think and act and respond the same way. We're not likely to move towards Hamas that embraces Sunni extremism, is ideological and religiously committed unlike anything that exists in Israel. Israel's never had a religious government. It's always had a secular government. And that's not likely to change. Indeed, the political movement in Israel today is away from extreme religious participation in government, drafting religious students into the army. The one thing that a majority of Israelis will agree upon is that the religious Groups in Israel have too much influence. Of course, the religious groups feel they have too little influence. But the majority is of the view that religion and politics should not mix in Israel, just as the majority of Americans feel the same way about our country. The fundamental interests are what drive the relationship. And I don't see that changing. Uh, is Prime Minister Netanyahu the best public relations person on behalf of Israel and his relationship with the President of the United States? Absolutely not. He may come in number 10, a list of 10. But the fact is that doesn't affect the fundamental relationship. The American public, and I have the Pew Research Report of just two months ago, from July, three months ago, shows no change in public support for Israel vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. And that question is directed to the Palestinians. This was doing the war in Gaza. If it had been directed to Hamas, the difference would have been even more stark. Among Republicans, as Steve said, it's 10 to 1. Among Democrats, it's 3 to 1. 
And as Steve said, support for Islam among Hispanics, Afro-Americans, younger people is less than among the public at large. But that's always been true. It's true among American Jews too. The younger American Jews in the age groups 19 to 29 are the least supportive of Israel. But what happens when they become 65, they've changed. Will that be true of other Americans? Of course it was, it will be. Will Hispanics become more pro-Israel? I don't know. Will Afro-Americans, as they become more part of the American society, don't see themselves as a group apart? The answer is yes. Is the politicalization of this issue between Democrats and Republicans good for our country or good for Israel? The answer is no on both counts. But we are a democracy and we take it as it is. I do not see in the foreseeable future, although there'll be peaks and valleys, there'll be good days and bad days. I don't see it in the statistics and I don't see it among the American Jewish community. There's been very little change among the American Jewish community. One thing that has happened is the leadership of the American Jewish community has tilted in the direction of Bibi Netanyahu. And that's for a very simple reason. You tilt to whomever the prime minister is because you want to be able to see the prime minister and bring the prime minister to your annual meetings and get letters from the prime minister and get your picture taken with the prime minister. It's the reality. If the next prime minister of Israel is someone from the Labor Party, you'll see things shifting a bit. People want to have their picture taken with the prime minister. They want to embrace him. They want to call him his friend. They want him to call that person, man or woman, by their first names. So. These are the realities. When I look at the underlying tendencies in both countries, within the communities, the history, but most importantly, the alignment of the fundamental interests of the two countries, there'll be changes, but the relationship, in my view, is not likely to go off course. Now, I invite all of you to come back here, let's say, in Jack, which we say 25 years. Jack is my classmate. And look at this issue again, we'll be much wiser. Incidentally, Jack, I just want to reassure you that longevity is not a reward for virtue. <laughs> At least on my part. <laughs> my bottom line is, could it move? Yes. Will it move? In my judgment, I see no basis for coming to that conclusion sitting here today. Thank you very much. David, on to you. First, um, it's an honor really to be with uh, Dan, Steve, Al, uh, people I have enormous respect for. It's kind of, uh, you know, it's my first speech back on campus uh, since being in the government. I, I hope I don't talk like I'm out of the State Department. I'm trying to purge that. But uh, this is my first speech, so um, I'm, it's, it's an honor to see so many, many of you, and it's an honor to serve the country. Um, Look, where am I, let me just give you the kind of, I'll try to be telegraphic to, to try to get as much in as possible and allow maximum time for discussion. What is my view? I share more Al's view about fundamentals. I don't wanna sweep under the rug the tension and therefore my remarks will be, be colored by what I went through personally um, over these last 10 months. And, but why are, where do I think that the uh, allegations or whatever are a bit overstated. Um, so those are kind of basically the three areas I want to cover in the short time that I have here. Look, um, without belaboring the things that um, Al said, I tend to agree with him on, on the shared values uh, and the shared interests. Uh, basically, I think you've got broad support. Um, the Hill can't even agree what day of the week it is, uh, but there's one issue they have bipartisan support for, and, and, and that's Israel. On the polling data, the, the Pew Research polls, which attract a lot of attention, even among people called, who identified as liberal Democrats, 39-21 um, Israel. It's not the same as Republicans, obviously, which was 73 to, I don't know, nine, I'm not exactly sure, but, but even among uh, uh, African Americans, Hispanics, where there's a lot of uh, anxiety, certainly in the Jewish community, the numbers are 43 to 20 Israel, 
uh, in terms of who you sympathize with. Uh, and among the Hispanic community, it's, uh, these are all from this July, 41 to 17. So those, there's a lot of hue and cry about that, but the numbers really, I don't think, bear itself out, as the critics have argued. Now, can things change? Of course. Uh, but I think that's worth saying, evangelicals 70 to 5. Um, so that, but, I mean, the goal of the peace process, hopefully, is we don't want this to be a zero sum. I mean, I got engaged in this because we want dignity for both sides. We want to have a two-state solution that fits with both. But I do think if, you, if the focus of this panel is about the U.S.-Israel, not as much as peace, um, I'm happy to, to discuss that if you have any questions. Um, I think it's stronger than it looks. Um, you would say in the intelligence relationship and in, in the security relationship, you've had uh, Ayud Barak was the defense minister. You've had Bibi Netanyahu say it's never been better uh, in that regard. So I mean, a lot of the fundamental pillars and amid the regional uncertainty of the Arab upheaval, which began in 2011, you know, Israel looks pretty steady in, in comparison. So I think that's in terms of broad brush strokes. Now, I don't want to brush under the carpet the tension, because the tension has been there. Um, and this is where I guess my uh, not being the State Department anymore will come out. Um, look, there's clearly been differences at the top. And clearly, you know, Israel feels it's been misunderstood uh, by this administration. It's a small country and a, in a very difficult neighborhood at a very difficult time of upheaval, turmoil, earthquakes, uh, hurricanes. And they don't feel they get always uh, the requisite love that way. Uh, these, uh, the president over the summer very much, um, you know, was talking about how mindful Israel was of civilian casualties. This is not unique to this White House, I would say. Uh, I remember, if anyone remembers Ronald Reagan in, in 1982, had a picture on his desk in the Oval Office of a Palestinian child and called the Begin uh, during a war ravaged Beirut to complain. The White House is always very image conscious. It, that, that's not unique. But uh, the differences between these leaders, I think uh, uh, the tension has come up um, from, you know, from time to time that, that we, can't, uh, uh, you know, we can't dismiss. Would it would have also fed the tension? I think in terms of, uh, and Martin Indyk, uh, who was the one who brought me in um, to the government, uh, you know, the, the concern that the US is pivoting to Asia. And that is not always understood in the American uh, pod, you know, public as well. The belief, will you really be there? And this came up, you can imagine, with the security arrangements issue. Well, if you have you know, these security arrangements, but if you left Iraq, you left Afghanistan, will you leave the Jordan River? Um, I think that, that issue is a question. I think another question was the framework agreement, which is the area that I was most intensely involved in. Um, I feel it was a bit unfair the way it was depicted in the media. Uh, Martin has also said it was a 50-50 thing in terms of where the blame lay. Uh, but there was clearly an element of tension. Israel to think they should even be called 50-50, being that President Abbas never gave President Obama an answer to the framework that we presented him on March 17th. Uh, there's been tension over the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, clearly, Israel's very happy uh, with the new government in Egypt. Uh, I think they would consider this the golden age in terms of their relationship with the Egyptians. They believe the fact that there was a ceasefire in Gaza this summer was only because of Egypt. And we, the United States and the Egyptians, made sure that Hamas did not come out ahead. We wanted the Palestinian Authority to come out ahead. So there was, um, but there will be differences. On Iran, clearly this has also been an issue uh, where actually both uh, dedicated to the idea nobody wants Iran to have a nuclear weapon. But how do you define where, at what point they can go um, has been a point of difference. And each one of these points is about eight subpoints. I just don't have time uh, right now. But now, so I'm not here to say there hasn't been any tension, but I think that we should put in some sort of context. First of all, nobody's looking for a fight. Um, as, uh, as Steve or Al said, Israel uh, is dependent on the United States. Maybe its economy has grown so greatly, it's now got the population of, uh, of a middle-level European company, uh, country. It's, it's safely in the OECD, the most advanced uh, 24 countries, wealthiest countries. So, but still, the, it's not just the aid, it's the hardware. 
uh, um, and that relationship is important. And so I don't, and Israeli political public, publics, when they come to election time, uh, they don't like it when their prime minister mismanages the American account. Uh, that's why Yitzhak Shamir was not prime minister in 1992. Um, so I think that there's no percentage in it for Israelis. Um, um, Shimon Peres famously said that Israel is the one country that has gotten so much support uh, from the United States, but remains staunchly pro-American. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, you know, on the on on the on the president's side, there's no effort to exacerbate things either. Uh, we've got other things uh, that we're fighting now in the United States. We're dealing with the ISIS element, which really, you know, we came to full uh, force after the Gaza uh, ceasefire. We've got the Ukraine. We've got a lot of foreign policy issues. I'm not even mentioning Ebola or other issues to deal with. No one uh, wants a fight. Um, and certainly if there's an Iran deal on November 24th, although people in the press say the odds aren't great, clearly this president is going to want to work with Israel in terms of the United States Congress to help get that through, which will not be easy. And um, But I think that's a fact, that nobody is spoiling for a fight here. And uh, like I said, on the framework issue, I think it's more nuanced. Believe me, if you could give me six hours, I would tell you why. Uh, it's more nuanced in terms of who's to blame. And um, it's not as one-sided as maybe some of the critics make it appear. The settlement issue is also, I mean, that's an area that I dealt with very intimately over this last year. It's almost as if one country is playing baseball and the other one's playing basketball. They're not talking the same language. And I don't want to bore you and get so deep in the weeds because we don't have the time. But basically, two-thirds of the settlement tenders, what we call the construction area, was in the 1.9% of the land closest to the green line. The green line is the pre-1967 boundary that Abbas um, you know, said would be Israeli anyway. Uh, people don't know that. Now, Netanyahu, ironically, could improve things with the United States by pointing that out, but he doesn't because he's got right-wing coalition people like uh, Mr. Bennett and the Jewish Home Party that doesn't want to hear that. Um, and so, because, but most Americans don't go around with a map. So we don't know where this stuff is going on. And the last two ones that actually had the, had the and, and Dan pointed out to one of them, were within a, f a, a few hundred yards of the green line. Now this is not to excuse it, because we in the United States saw through a different prism, which is, yeah, that area's gonna be Israel either. We realize it's not provocative in the sense that you're building on what we call the other side of the security barrier, which is the barrier where 92% of the West Bank is located. We're talking about within you know 1% of the land, or 2%. But the point is, um, in the United States, we tend to focus on where's Abbas after Gaza? Uh, how do we catapult the PA forward? It's, it's the newspaper headline more than it is the geography. So if Israel's looking at through the lens of geography, and this will be Israel anyway, US, this administration tended to see it differently. The last point here um, I would just make is the issue of the region. You know, the old the old approach prism is changing in the sense that it used to be a zero-sum game. If you got closer to Israel, you got further away from the Arabs. And now, first of all, we're doing our own energy independence in this country, thankfully. Um, but really, it's been true for 20 years that the Arab states have really aligned their relations with the US. I would argue the Gulf Arabs, the ones that we count on the most independently of where the US-Israel relationship is. And now it's taken to a new level that the US, uh, that the Gulf Arabs and the Israelis are actually, in some ways, more united on concerns about the Iranian nuclear negotiations, the fear of the Muslim Brotherhood, the concern of, of, of extremism in the region. In a way, the United States is the odd man out. And we Americans never think of it that way. But you know, the joke of the State Department used to be you know, you guys are going to complain about the Obama administration for the first hour of your talks, of your secret talks between the Gulf and Israel. Why don't you cut it down to a half an hour so you'll have more productive time to deal with other issues? <laughs> so the fact that they are all saying we don't have the resolve 
and that they are more united together is something that the United States has never had to deal with. So I'm saying take this all together. What you're seeing is there's a lot of different breaks and constraints on the relationship of, of the problematic dimensions. Now, I'm not here to say that 25 years it's going to look exactly the same. Clearly, if the Palestinian issue isn't dealt with, this is going to look differently. But I think there's a difference to say there are things we could do together. Um, we might not be able to do 100% of the things we could do together. But the fact is, as someone who was involved in the negotiations, I can say that we were able to bring this conflict from the differences from here, sorry about that, <laughs> to here. And it looks a little different from the inside. We couldn't close the gaps. But it looks a little different from the inside. So if your premise is one of intransigence, you're going to see this one way. If you're saying, hey, there's a problem here, the Palestinians rejected a lot of the places. They didn't even come back to us with responses. The, the situation is far more messy and complicated than it appears to read from an editorial. Then I think you're going to see that there's not going to be this downward slide in the US Israel relationship that some of the critics would allege. We should deal with the tension, absolutely, but we need to put it into some context. Thank you all very much. David, I'm having uh, palpitations from all the sense that there's much more coming and that we have to hurry up. Um, OK, so uh, I'm going to show um, superhuman restraint now and not ask a question myself. And what I would like to do first is we have two uh, distinguished Israeli uh, uh, scholars here in the audience. I'd like to ask each of them for uh, a brief response, and then we'll open it up to uh, broader questions to the rest of the audience. So why don't we talk, uh, begin with Professor Benny Miller, who's also visiting here in the government department. Okay, uh, well, the oh, you, need, uh, you need the mic. <laughs> I we don't want to say something new, but basically I think the basic question is what, are the li what is the likelihood of realignment on both sides, from the American side and from the Israeli side, away from the uh, American-Israeli uh, alliance? I think the key the key argument in the United States, especially kind of the Mir Shaman and World uh, Book and the Israel lobby, was that uh, Israel is the key source of anti-Americanism in the Middle East. I think very briefly that the Arab Spring and all what is going on in the Middle East in recent years show very clearly the, the Middle East is much more complicated than just the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is very important, and for Israelis it's a crucially important. But for Middle East broadly. Um, I mean, uh, the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is just part of the agenda, and it's, uh, the, um, the agenda is much more complicated. And in this sense, Israel is not the key source necessarily of anti-Americanism in the Middle East. So I think that, uh, um, in, a f in fact, the Arab Spring and the consequences of it reduce the, the reduces to some extent the prospect of America realignment from Israel. Then on the Israeli side, I think it's very intriguing, the, the issue that uh, Steve raised here. Uh, about this realignment with China and India with the rising powers instead of with the United States. I mean, uh, f first of all, it's the first time in Israel history that it has, at least theoretically, the prospect of realignment because always, especially during the Cold War, Israel really didn't have any, any uh, uh, probability of realignment with another power. Uh, but, um, uh, and, and, and the China and India are definitely uh, rising uh, trading uh, partner, and they don't care so much on human rights and settlements and all these issues, so in this sense, it may be attractive for, for Israel. But, I mean, in, uh, I mean, Israeli dependence on the United States is so high, is so great, so I think there is no Israeli statesman that takes seriously this option. I mean, it's, it's nice, especially for Lieberman, for the Israeli foreign minister, maybe to raise this idea that <laughs> there are some other prospects, but it's really uh, uh, not a very serious uh, idea if you just look at the strategic security issue. And, and actually, as uh, uh, some members of the pa panel mentioned, the Obama administration actually was the most supportive of all the American administration, definitely more than the Eisenhower administration, who was, uh, was quite anti-Israeli, um, in, in supporting, strategically support for, uh, for the state of Israel. So in this sense, actually, from the strategic security point of view, there is no worsening of, of the relation, quite the, quite the opposite. Obviously, the re in Iranian nuclear issue still remains at the agenda, and we don't know precisely what will happen, and that might affect the relations. But from both sides, I think the prospect of realignment actually de uh, declined and are not, um, are not of a very high uh, likelihood. 
and definitely from the Israeli point of view, I think the dependence on the United States, the United States is only the only reliable ally of the United S of Israel that Israel can really trust, especially in times of crisis. Question of resupply, like for example, in 1973 war. I mean, only the United States can say it. N neither India nor China will play this role. So in this sense, I think, despite all the um, um, some disagreements between the current government and the, the American uh, uh, government. Israeli public is very much pro-American, despite maybe some extreme right-wing uh, sector of the Israeli society. And uh, in this sense, definitely from the Israeli point of view, there is great eagerness for maintaining, preserving, and enhancing the relation with the United States. Thank you very much. Let's, let's <laughs> Professor Bernie Avishai. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, there were so many um, uh, observations, there's no way to respond to them all coherently <laughs> except to say the following. Um, when the title of this panel was uh, put forward, um, I have to admit, as someone who's been sort of trying to fight for a certain style of thinking within Israel for a long time, um, the prospect of greater tension between Israel and the United States was very appealing to me. <laughs> and uh, all three panelists are dealing with this as if, no, no, uh, you know, no, we can mitigate the tensions. Um, I don't think mitigating those tensions are actually very good for Israel. Uh, at, you know, at, at a fundamental sense, sure, when we're talking about Israeli security, um, there are common interests which have been spoken of much more eloquently uh, than I can now, but there's also another issue, which is internal Israeli politics. Now, David sort of alluded to this when he said, you know, Shamir lost the election in 92 because he seemed to have screwed up the relations with Washington. We're talking about these two countries as if they are sort of both great diplomatic players and like we're talking about the relations between sort of Germany and France after, you know, in the time of Metternich or something. I mean, no, no, no. We're talking about a country of seven million people and the United States of America. We're talking about a, a city-state which is economically dependent on uh, a knowledge economy which the American government and the American economy dominate. Um, I mean, the idea of, of you know, Israel going to India and China is, is so absurd. Um, uh, Israel will go where it goes to university. Um, in a knowledge economy and a country whose economy is networked to a knowledge economy, Israel will be in the Western orbit because that's where its science is. The idea that just because it sells some rockets to India, that means it's going to have a strategic partnership with India is ridiculous. But leave that aside for a moment. I, I want to come back to the question of internal Israeli affairs. <coughs> Tension in Israel over the management of the relationship with Washington, in my view, is not only welcome, it's necessary. And, uh, you know, part of the problem, the frustration, I think, that people involved with what I call the parties of global Israel instead of the parties of greater Israel, the parties of global Israel, meaning labor and the centrist parties and so forth, and including, by the way, the rising number of Arabs who are uh, uh, Israeli citizens who, in a state of tension, clearly create a very difficult strategic problem for Israel, but in a state of hope, actually become a little like our Hispanics, who will give a kind of permanent majority to the parties of global Israel over the next generation. These are people who are third generation born in the country who speak Hebrew a lot better than you do. And you know, so when we talk about the future, it's very important for the Israeli political system to feel this heat if the parties of 
global Israel are actually going to regain power. And don't forget, in the last election, they lost the election by one seat. One seat. So we talk about Israel as if Netanyahu is a kind of permanent feature and, a, and a, the permanent face of the country. But Netanyahu is not the permanent face of the country. Ehud Olmert would have made a different peace process with Abbas than Netanyahu did. When, when David said, you know, we got it from this to this, no, you got it from, you know, what it was with Olmert to this, <laughs> right? I mean, the, the problem was that Olmert had come so much closer than you ever got in this last round. So, so how does this relationship between Israel and America evolve in such a way that the, the parties that are capable of making peace actually feel the heat? That, for me, is the critical question for our future. OK, I'm, uh, two, two great interventions. And I'm going to take questions from the floor. Before I do, I just want to say that while I think most of us would agree that a shift to China or India may seem preposterous to us, um, as someone who also has dealt a lot with Israeli security issues, um, the notion of a cognitive bubble is a relevant one. And what we may see from the outside and what people, other people see from the inside uh, can be two very different things. So um, let's see some hands. George. We'll start right here. I, Class I, of 51 at Cornell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to keep Al uh, honest. Um, well, I'd be interested in how you think that the um, ISIS uh, problem <laughs> is going to affect uh, Israel and the United States and their relationship. You, you, you're, you're sort of Mr. Counterterrorism when I'm not. <laughs> well, um, you know, it, it will and it won't. I mean, it, it will in the sense that um, a response to the um, uh, to the burgeoning advances of ISIS, um, to the extent that they're not met by what the Israelis would consider a decisive response, will further um, uh, you know will further diminish uh, confidence in the United States as a security guarantor, which is in a sense. Uh, a theme of, of all three presentations, although from different perspectives. So um, in that sense, I think it would uh, affect the relationship. But uh, does ISIS, uh, you know, really affect Israeli interests? Um, uh, from a security perspective, I mean, from that angle, um, I don't think there's a really big issue, although there is some uh, evidence of al-Qaeda trying to infiltrate uh, Israel. Uh, to carry out terrorist attacks, and and I'm sure that ISIS, given its, um, uh, you know, very close connection ideologically uh, to um, uh, to Al Qaeda, will try to do that as well. I just want to. Uh, you want to go ahead? There? Go ahead. All right. I would just say, look, actually, uh, sir, I see what you're saying, kind of connected to Bernie in in a different way, which is, you know, when you get to the issue of security arrangements in the Jordan Valley. All right. Now, we heard this before the ISIS issue really hit the headlines in a big way and before Gaza, which is, you know, the United States, we are trying to make sure that things cannot be smuggled in, you know, via the Jordan River into the West Bank, which, you know, the Jordan Valley would be the eastern uh, security perimeter of uh, a Palestinian state. And Clearly, this is not something that Prime Minister Netanyahu or Defense Minister Yalon wanted to hear. And they'll say, look, the whole Middle East is an earthquake. Uh, who knows what's going to be in Iraq? Who knows what's going to be in Jordan? Um, it, the, the whole place is turning upside down. There's never The Middle East is on fire in a way that it hasn't been before. And that argument was certainly made by Prime Minister Netanyahu this summer in terms of ISIS and of, in terms of Gaza, when, Gaza you know, when Hamas was able to lead to debris falling near the Israeli airport, 
where the FAA says no, no trip, you know, no flights coming in, uh, or the tunnels that were going cross-border from Gaza to Israel. Now Netanyahu used, used all that and used the ISIS threat to say, see, I was vindicated on security arrangements. And I think, to me, to, to connect it to Bernie's point, and uh, um, I admire Bernie's writings, I, I think that the issue of security arrangements is, it's, it's, I, I came in a government, let's put it this way, I, let me put it in personal terms, where I, I have my own mea culpa. I came into the United States government believing borders and security were the more technocratic issues that could be dealt with more dispassionately. I, I, of course, I knew the territory was, was very, uh, you know, all the emotion and the biblical sight. I mean, you know, obviously I knew that. But having worked on maps, I could see the solution there. Um, when it came to issues like Jerusalem and Palestinian refugees, I was concerned that that cut to the issues of self-definition of the parties, dealing with issues like nationalism, religion, in a way that I just didn't know if you could solve it. I came out of government believing that it was actually <laughs> the border arrangements that would able to resonate, certainly with the Israeli public in a way. Even if you use the word NATO 27 times and use the word US uh, forces 28 times, that those terms, if, if it was defined by the political leadership as existential uh, because of a threat of ISIS or because of all the volcanic nature of the Middle East, you wouldn't be able to go over the heads of these leaders to their publics. Um, and uh, I, I'm saying that, therefore, there are certain issues where the U.S. can have an impact on. I'm not so sure on some of these issues that the United States, given the regional context of ISIS, Gaza, and everything else, and, and a regional upheaval, where their people are going to listen to us more than they're going to listen to their own leadership especially when we're leaving Iraq and we're leaving Afghanistan. So I just think we got to have a sense of humility of where we're going to be able to frame the issues. I don't know if we could frame them on every issue, and I think the ISIS and slash border arrangements question is an example where we're not as well positioned, and that's one of my takeaways leaving the government. George, let me make another observation. I think ISIL will have a profound influence. Let me tell you why. Uh, when you and I were starting in this game, it was the Arab-Israeli war. Nobody talks about Arab-Israeli war now. It's Palestinian-Israeli, very different. And what is the Arab world today? The Arab world is split between those governments and those countries that are stable, like it or not, Egypt, Sunni, Jordan, Sunni, Saudi Arabia, Sunni. The Gulf states, try to play it both ways, particularly Qatar, which wants to be both a friend of ISIL and a friend of the West. The other, the United Arab Emirates, very much with the U.S., anti-ISIL. What you have that's emerged is now with ISIL, you've got Sunni extremism in Iraq, running into Syria, Hamas. Sunni extremism, ideological, religiously committed. You've got Shia extremism, Iran, Hezbollah. Two terrorist operations, case of Iran, a nation state. The Middle East is split. Israel's trying to tread water. It can't defeat either. As I think all of us on this panel would agree, Israel's best hope for the future is to work out some arrangement with the Palestinian Authority that is ethnic, uh, has some elements of moderation, doesn't have strong leadership, doesn't have strong cohesion, but it's its best partner for peace, is there is a partner for Israel in the Middle East. And the tragedy is that those two countries, called the Palestinian Authority a country, and Israel have been unable to minimize their differences to the point where they can reach agreement, whether it's here or here. Incidentally, Omer was here, but Abbas wasn't here. He never responded to Omer's last pr proposal. Well, that's what, what, we, that's, that's, what, that's what, okay, that's what we think. Uh, incidentally, on, on Lieberman, and I liked your point, Netanyahu referred to Lieberman when he was objecting to his policies in Gaza as that person who's uttering background noise. So there's a lot of, uh, of dissension within the Israeli uh, society, even within the government. Uh, 
But I wanted to make the point simply that the Middle East is very different, and you put your finger on it. You also made the very good point that the Obama administration has been the most forthcoming in terms of military support for Israel. Iron Dome, the hats, the arrow to uh, putting them on our intelligence band, instant intelligence, long-range radar, David Sling, it, it go, and now the, the F-35s. Uh, it, the military supply by the United States to Israel has been nothing short of phenomenal. And makes the point that our two Israeli friends said, you're not going to find that in India or, or in China, not by a long shot. Have we got any student hands? There we go, I think. You had a lot of hands before. Yeah. You intimidated. We, we suppressed them all. So you talked, all of you talked a lot about um, political support or not support within the U.S. for um, U.S.-Israeli relations. I was wondering if any of you could potentially speak to the effect of the burgeoning tech industry in Israel and whether you think the Silicon Valley um, Israel tech relationship could potentially booster economic support support within the U.S. for a U.S.-Israeli relationship? I'm inclined to respond on the grounds of conflict of interest. I'm a major investor <laughs> in, in Israeli high tech, and I can tell you at this point, I've not made any money. <laughs> Look, I mean, it's, you know, the Israelis will tell you how they're like the second largest uh, country on the NASDAQ outside the United States itself. Uh, it's created, uh, I mean, if, if uh, Bernie talks about a global Israel, a global that's more aware of what's going on around it, it's clearly, um, I think it's a force in that direction as well. Uh, at the same time, Israel's largest trading partner is actually Europe. And to the extent there's any talk about trade sanctions, it would come from Europe. And Israel does have to care about that because they're its largest trade partner. So the high tech gets a lot of the attention, rightly so. And there's a lot of pride in Israel that, uh, about their involvement and on, on, on all sorts of things. By the way, it extends in the, in the defense sector, not purely high tech. Uh, this isn't a high tech issue, but things like armor that American troops wore in Iraq. Uh, there's been a lot of Israeli innovations. So, um, you know, I think that that's, a, that's obviously an element that's brought the two countries together, and uh, it's, it's a welcome development. The business sector there feels that they don't have the clout that they have in this country, Chamber of Commerce, roundtables, et cetera. Uh, there's been an effort called breaking the impasse of, of businessmen on the Israeli and Palestinian side, which I think is a very interesting development. And maybe it shows a new sense of confidence of the business community in, in both of these things. By the way, there's a lot of Palestinian software working with Israeli high tech. So if you want to see somewhere where cooperation could happen, and I'm always someone focused on Israeli-Palestinian, I, I look to the high tech uh, issue. One point, the Palestinian cell phone industry is located oh. in Gaza. Over here, please. Um, can, the United, can the United States ever reach a point where we can say that the unconditional support for Israel is not worth it in the sense that it's alienating too many other people in the world. I mean, like if we look at the recent um, conflict with Gaza, most of the coverage in the world, except for the United States, was very, um, I mean, it saw Israel as an aggressor, right? And I think a lot of people around the world feel very upset at the United States for, for such support. So, I mean, can the ever, uh, if we look at it from a purely American perspective, can we ever reach a point where we can say that it's actually a liability for the United States just to give such unconditional support to Israel? Well, look, I'll just say that, look, I was looking at the Pew numbers from this summer, which were taken during the war, and the American, like I said, the evangelical community was 70 to 5 in support of Israel. The U.S. general public was 49 to 12. Uh, and the low, and at, at one point, it, uh, yeah, that was its lowest point. It was 51 to 14, it was 53 to 11, uh, two months before the war. So, I mean, if you look at public support, I think there is a, f a feeling that, you know, if there wouldn't have been indiscriminate firings against Israel, there wouldn't have been a war. And, uh, and that therefore, that this war, and, and Abbas, President Abbas of the Palestinian Authority, he really castigated uh, Hamas, as did uh, Shukri, the foreign minister of Egypt, who said, you guys are crazy that what you needed, you got on day one of the war. There was no need for this 50-day thing. 
So, I mean, don't believe the Israelis, don't believe the Americans. I mean, but Abbas on the Palestinian authorities was saying, Hamas, you provoked a needless war. And I think that that was, in my view, accurate. The support for Israel during the height of the Gaza war among the American public as reflected in the Pew poll was higher than it was going back 25 years, 1978. So we don't see that. Yeah, there were demonstrations in Europe, absolutely. A lot of them Muslim-led, but let's assume not exclusively. There's always been support for the Palestinian cause among academia in Europe on the left, some here in the United States. Uh, that's a fact, but there hasn't been any sea change. Uh, and if Israel were to lose out, however you define that, it would be seen in the world as an American loss. Make no mistake about it. The two countries are joined at the hip, for better or for worse. And for Israel to suffer a major defeat of one sort or another, that would be perceived in the world as a defeat for the United States. I say that to you whether you agree or disagree in terms of liking it or not liking it, but I think it's a fact. So let me tie a few of the different threads up here and just ask a question of our panelists. What does it do to the sustainability of the relationship, the durability, the depth, the breadth, if the perception persists for, say, another five to seven years, uh, given what you spoke about regarding the Arab Spring, for example, and the turmoil outside of Israel's borders, if the perception hardens that Israel's not interested in peace with the Palestinians? Right. Uh, Israel do what? That Israel is not interested in peace with the Palestinians. That is, the Prime Minister has said, uh, it's a situation to be managed, not to be solved. What does that do to uh, our relationship? Because it seems to me a constitutive part of our view, the United States' view, that we have an interest in peace, and that's a vital interest. Look, I think there's no doubt. I mean, I was saying how complicated it was being in the middle of this and all the countervailing forces, the technical issues at play, areas where we didn't get responses. Um, but if it's one thing to say, okay, and I think your, your question is an excellent one, Dan. It's one thing to say, look, you can't do maybe Israel the classic solution because, yeah, maybe Henry Kissinger and James Baker had it much easier in a certain way uh, because they were all dealing with states. And what's hard maybe for a student at Dartmouth to see is, the whole landscape has changed because what y your parents would be looking at if they were sitting here would be states, battlefields, you know, people wearing, uh, you know, uniforms, everything looking like an interstate conflict. Now you look around the neighborhood and you see, wow, there's a non-state actor, Hezbollah, really running things in Lebanon. Oh, the Golan Heights on the Syrian side. Uh, it, Kunetra and everything is not run by the Syrian army anymore. It's run by an offshoot of Al Qaeda called Jubhat al Nusra. Uh, oh, in, in Gaza, it's run by Hamas. These are all, to put it uh, maybe in very antiseptic academic terms, non state actors who don't play by the usual rules, who believe you can indiscriminately hit cities and you can use your own people as human shields. And that is going to complicate things. So it's one thing to say the classic solutions of security arrangements with non-state actors is going to look different than if Henry Kissinger or James Baker were around in the 70s, early 90s. It would look differently today. Uh, but it's another thing to, to get to Dan's question is, okay, maybe that piece of it you can't do. But what about the rest of it? Uh, and I think if the perception hardens that it's not because of that one piece you can't do, but you can't do anything, that is going to, that's going to take a toll. And that's why I didn't want to say what is will always be what will be. Um, and if the Palestinian polity is, is led by authority and not by Hamas. Um, so therefore, it very much the details are important here of what is possible. Are you doing the maximum you can do? I think that to me is the question. And uh, I, I do think that there was more behind the scenes that the public will know, which, which drives me up a wall. But, um, and we're not allowed to talk about it, but the, but the point is, is that, that if people think you're not doing the maximum, you're not putting out a moral narrative for the future uh, that is compelling that way, then it'll, that it will have a, an impact over time. But I, I don't think we're there yet uh, at, at this point. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, not a syllable. Um, 
Oh, well, uh, David's right. I mean, we're not there yet. Uh, the, the, although there's, you know, there are indications. They, uh, Dan asked about the five-year time frame, and I, and I think it, it depends in part at that five-year horizon what the narrative is in terms of culpability, if I can put it that way. In other words, will publics in the United States and in other countries perceive Israel as having been responsible for the failure to achieve peace, um, or will they place the blame on the other on the other party, whoever the other party is at that point? Because we're looking at a change uh, in Palestinian politics that is likely to be quite profound. Um, so, uh, you know, difficult, difficult really to call five years out because you don't know, uh, of course, who's going to be blamed. What we do know, um, uh, since we're all tossing about, you know, polling uh, data, is that um, uh, longi in, in longitudinal polls, Americans have said um, consistently that they think the failure to, of parties, of the parties out there to achieve a peace, to achieve a peace, is damaging the U.S. interests, and the uh, the survey returns regarding approval for Israel tend to go down at periods when Israel is perceived. This is in the United States as being responsible for whatever the barrier was um, to whichever process was in play at that time. And I think you can um, extrapolate from uh, from those two. Um, uh, uh, you know, survey trends, what you might see in the United States in five years. I think, um, again, depending on, uh, on the narrative of who's at fault. The other thing is that it's not just the United States that's at play here. As has been pointed out, Europe is really quite important uh, as an economic and diplomatic um, uh, player in terms of Israel's interests. And um, uh, I rather think that the Europeans, regardless of the facts of the matter, to the extent that they can actually be established at that point in the game, um, will tend to put the onus on Israel for having uh, blown it. And, uh, and, I, and I think that they will be in a punitive mood. This is already um, you know, pretty evident. And it's going to be a real problem against other trends that are unfolding in Israel, particularly the very interesting regard to the very interesting distinction that Bernie made between the global Israel and the and the greater Israel. Because the, in terms of the global Israel, um, in I mean, in addition to these demographic changes that we've talked about just a bit, there's we're beginning to see the effects of uh, about. 30 years of underinvestment in education in Israel. And it's really very bad. Um, is, Israeli school children rank just above Portugal, about t number 21 in global rankings of educational um, uh, skills and attainment and so forth. And English language capacity in Israel is shrinking as a proportion of the school age population. So, you know, the notion of a global Israel against these facts, um, you know, it, it, might, it might be a mirage, actually. But, but, the, but the Europe, uh, the European angle here on, to, in relation to Dan's question, I think is is really uh, quite important. I'm going to be very bold and make a prediction. You ready? <laughs> the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is going to shrink in importance for the American public. There are just so many other issues out there that are more important. And the Middle East is such a jungle. We're going to be more concerned about radicalism Sunni and Shia. I'm not predicting another 9-11, but it could occur, and it's not going to come from the Israelis. It's going to come from ISIL. It's going to come from Shia. That's our concern. You go to Homeland Security in the United States, they're not concerned about what Israel's doing. They're concerned about what radicalism in the Middle East is going to lead to. Radicalism leads to terror, and terrorism leads to attacks, indiscriminate attacks, with no state address to respond to. So I don't think the United States public is going to be very concerned with whether Israel is responsible 
the Palestinian Authority is responsible. Who gets more blame? Who gets more credit if progress is made? It is diminishing in importance. There was a time when people thought that if you could solve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, you've solved all the problems in the Middle East. Today, we know that simply is not true. It may rank number three, number four, number five in terms of importance of conflicts. And fewer people are being killed in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict are being killed by internecine warfare among the contending Muslim and Islamic forces in the Middle East. It's the sad reality. Uh, what you said about the diminishing number of English speakers in, in Israel is probably true, but there are a diminishing number of Hebrew speakers in the United States as well. Okay, um, we are running out of time. If we have any more student questions, I'd particularly like to see those hands. Very quiet, and it's because the students here actually already get that non-state actor thing, by the way. Okay, over here, please. We got a lot over there. A hypothetical question. Um, if Hillary Clinton uh, becomes the next president of the United States, will the climate be more favorable towards uh, between America and Israel? Who knows? <laughs> None of us uh, is among, qualified among to answer American that. Jews. <laughs> Okay, among American Jews, because I also get the Jewish polls, she is the odds-on favorite. What does that tell you? I don't know. And I know Mrs. Clinton quite well, very well. I just had dinner with her last week, sitting right next to her. I don't know. I know what her husband thinks, but I don't know what she thinks. Um, will her election be greeted with overwhelming enthusiasm in Israel? No. People will remember her kissing Mrs. Arafat. That's what will be on on the memory block. Uh, what her policies will be, I'm going to leave it to the experts to respond. I'll just, I'll just say one thing. President Clinton was in Israel, uh, this is the husband, uh, you know, when uh, in the 90s when things were, where four bombs went off in nine days, I remember being a journalist. And he came and he talked to high school kids and talked to them about their future in the 21st century. And I know critics of the president will say, you know, oh, that empathy, it's not sincere, the bridge to the 21st century, I heard it a hundred times. But he touched, he touched a chord in Israel. And it wasn't just the shalom chaver of being at the funeral and said, I never loved anyone, uh, you know, any man like I love Yitzhak Rabin. He came across as very genuine. And uh, I mean, I saw polls that were saying if he ran for prime minister, they thought he'd win by a landslide. <laughs> so I, I do think that that Clinton sense of aura and empathy would be something that certainly I think I'm for the Israeli public, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll have a, a big positive impact more than the kiss of Suha. I, I also think that as Al pointed out, what about 70, 75, sometimes 80, uh, percent of, of American Jews vote for Democrats, so I, I tend to think that she starts with a you know a certain aura that is is you know I think is going to be helpful to her, and she a lot of the tension of the last several years she could say well I wasn't in the White House, as I think she started to do with this Jeffrey Goldberg interview uh, that she did a couple months ago. Um, so I mean I think there's a few factors that would suggest I talked to one. Jewish uh, Democratic fundraiser who said to me, we're going to do terrible this midterms in terms of fundraising, but boy, 2016 looks good. So, I mean, um, I think that there's a certain, you know, starts at a different place for, for those constituencies. Now, how she will do policy-wise, obviously, as Al said, uh, is very much to be seen. Right. Now, Bill Clinton was the most popular politician ever polled about in, in Israel, Sidra. I just want to say, uh, I'm not a, um, um, first of all, thank you very much to all of you, and I, I'm not a public policy expert. I am an expert in poetry and uh, and fiction, and uh, I want to pick up a, a phrase, well, I want to pick up a phrase that David used, um, before he said something about in the absence of a moral narrative, and I my ears picked that up because, and here I I want to uh, respectfully disagree with uh, Ambassador Moses's uh, 
evaluation, it's not good for Israel that there be no pressure on Israel to make peace with the Palestinian. It's not good for Israel, and I want to make that very clear, and I speak as somebody who's been part of the peace camp uh, for as long as it's existed. And there is something that is intangible, and that's why the, world, the word moral narrative is important here. I remember the only time in all the years I've lived in Israel, the only time that I felt a sense of hope was between 93 and 95 when I would, I don't know if you were writing, I don't think you were writing for Haaretz then, were you, David? I used to pick up Haaretz every morning and there was always good news. And there was good news because it was in the air. It was, the climate had changed. You could taste it. And when Rabin was assassinated, and we know it led up to it, there was such a sense of despair. And actually, the peace process was killed then, although it's been revived and hopefully it'll be revived again. I don't think we're giving enough credit to what can be released. I'm not saying that we're the only center of the universe. We are one center of the universe. And I believe that what can be released with a real, genuine peace arrangement is going to be, uh, you know, un it's, 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 it's going to be uncountable. But I think the whole neighborhood, so to speak, would benefit from it. And so I just want to talk about this intangible thing that you call the moral narrative. I th thank you, Sidra, very much. I, I appreciate it. And I, I was a journalist covering that period, and it was truly exhilarating. Uh, it had its scary moments uh, uh, because of the Hamas bombs that were going off, but there was a sense of, an, I would say, an, an era of possibility. And I fear now, I mean, I just have to be blunt as an analyst, and I would love everyone to leave saying we're on the verge of that now, but I worry that, and I just know what I went through in, in the last year in the government, because no one could say the, this administration was not blunt in the way it spoke and uh, was pulling punches or anything like that. But, you know, trust, once it's shattered, it's very hard. It's like putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. And we, we're, you know, we didn't have a peace camp, really, that we could play off of. I'm talking about in the U.S. government, on the Palestinian side or the Israeli side, that was, that we, you know, maybe we're romanticizing about the 90s, but I, I tend to think you're right. I think it was really there. There was a sense of hope. And the, the public was, it was more a sense of disbelief that we were dealing with on, on both sides because people became very jaundiced and they said, like, I've seen this all before. And they talk and talk, but they can't get to the finish line. And, and the problem was that the leaders, and I said this to, to my colleagues beforehand, basically would what they wanted on both sides, uh, and, and you know, to be fair, we have to say on both sides, and that was they wanted maximum room of political maneuverability and absolutely minimal public expectation. And because our only hope, Sidra, was you, was people who really sensed that there was a sense of momentum that would build. But if you take the people out of it, because we couldn't say, we weren't allowed because of confidentiality, uh, which I totally understand, uh, where the progress was, the public only hears bad news because that's what, the, that's what the spokesmen spew out on both sides. And so they didn't say, wow, they, you know, they, can, you know, they conceded here, they conceded there, which fit the leaders, what they wanted, which is don't get in my way. We're not going to do, David, what I would call synchronized political messaging that you know, you're going to do this gesture, then you're going to do this gesture, and then uh, a 21-year-old student studying at either Haifa University or at Bir Zayt in Ramallah is going to say, wow, this is different. You know, it's not like we hadn't thought of these ideas, by the way, of who would do what when, but the leaders didn't want anything of it uh, because they only thought it would, it, would, it, would, it would create a sense, well, if they are really that moderate, then, then you've got to do more. And it would create a sense of uh, you have to reciprocate even higher. And these leaders didn't want to hurt their coalitions, I think, on either side. And so the public was absent. And we were like negotiating in a hermetically sealed laboratory conditions where nothing could seep out. And I feel that was a shame because I feel people left with a sense of it's hopeless. And uh, I actually emerged with the sense that actually there was more hope than, than I thought. But, I, but that feeling that the public was not a, a player, they weren't a factor in the negotiations, 
I feel really hurt us. And again, when I look, you know, with nostalgia to what like Kissinger and Baker dealt with, I also deal with what Clinton dealt with in the 90s, where the public was a player because of the sense of an era of possibility. Okay, we've gone over. I'm sorry, there are still hands. I don't think I've been at a Dartmouth event yet where we had so many people remain in their seats to the bitter end, so I'm really delighted by that, and I want to thank you for staying. Let me say in closing, first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, our, our co-sponsor, Dartmouth Hillel, and Rabbi Boros is up here. I should have acknowledged him at the very beginning, and it's been a delight to partner with him on this. There will be a reception uh, immediately after, as fast as you can get up the stairs, uh, in the Russo Gallery here in Haldeman. And I want finally to close by thanking uh, uh, the three tenors of uh, uh, the U.S.-Israeli relationship. Thank you.